Welcome, everyone. Um, this is the first event in a two-day inquiry into the work of social histories. Uh, my name is Joey Orr. I'm curator for research um, and part of the Integrated Arts Research Initiative that's funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And these programs are presented in partnership with the KU Center for Sexuality and Gender Diversity. Um, you'll notice throughout the galleries that the work of social history has been already, has already sort of begun um, through our exhibitions here. So there's a photography exhibit in this main central court here, Larry Schwarm, Kansas Farmers. Um, also the ties that bind here that's looking at the history of Haiti in the United States. And after this talk, we also invite you to make your way up these stairs or by way of the elevator. In the south balcony, there's um, Passage, which is a three-channel video installation by South African artist Mahama Dissekeng that looks at the impact of slavery um, on that country. Um, one of the goals of the Integrated Arts Research Initiative is to structure str transdisciplinary inquiries where we think of artistic practices as their own methods for producing knowledge. And so this is one of the um, questions that we're interested in pursuing with um, this artist-led inquiry here. In addition to the exhibitions, I should say, um, also in the Brousseau Center for Learning, we have um, objects that have been selected from the permanent collection um, by visiting artist Adrian Stimson, if you'll raise your hand, Adrian, and he'll be performing at 1.30 p.m. this afternoon at the Haskell Indian Nations University Auditorium. And another case was selected by artist Tina Takamoto, if you'll raise your hand, and she will be presenting an experimental lecture tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m. in the Spencer Museum Auditorium. They also have one video piece each that's um, on display in the Brousseau that you can see after um, this program as well. Okay, this week we'll end with the exciting Unexpected Caribbean Symposium that's organized in part by Cecile Cillian here, acting chair and associate professor in African and African American Studies and director of the Institute of Haitian Studies. She also served as the 2017 faculty research fellow for the Integrated Arts Research Initiative to co-curate this exhibit with Spencer's curator for global and indigenous art, Casey Messick Braun. Um, Cecile and Casey will be in conversation today with New Orleans-based Haitian artist Ulrich Jean-Pierre, who is in the room. There he is. Um, Ulrich is an important Haitian-American artist, storyteller, and social commentator whose work serves to bring about political and social change. He sees his work as a testament to the struggle for freedom and independence that Haiti has come to symbolize. So join me in welcoming um, the speakers. Thank you, Joey, and welcome, everyone. I am battling a little bit of a cold, so if I'm speaking and you can't hear me, please just let me know. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Ulrich Jean-Pierre and uh, my wonderful colleague, Cecile Asilien. Um, and we are going to be walking around the gallery and looking at some specific works of art in the exhibition, um, but we thought we would start today's conversation by asking a more general question of Ulrich, and that is, could you describe for us a little bit about your artistic practice and what your process is um, in terms of how you find inspiration for your paintings and how you bring them to life? Thank you very much. Good morning. And thank you very much you know, and for coming. And I just want to say I certainly appreciate you know, the fact that you know, the Spencer Museums and its staff, you know, take the time and putting up you know, this wonderful show. And I appreciate you know, the show. And it is a wonderful uh, experience for me you know, to be here this morning. Uh, when it comes here to my uh, artistic uh, creating process, it goes you know, to different phases. Um, whereas uh, to create a painting, Normally, I started by uh, focusing on the subject first by doing some uh, researches on the subject in question, uh, whereas I spent many, t many hours um, reading, going to the libraries, 
and go to different institutions, museums, and read everything that I can find um, to gather information before I start you know, the physical creating process. Um, so we have been talking about decolonizing history, decolonizing knowledge. So you talk about going to the library, so official archives, is you, if you will. Can you talk about non-official knowledge? What are some other ways you are inspired besides the knowledge from the books and what have you? Well, um, as the, I mean, as you know, uh, it men, uh, when I say men, I'm talking about in general. I mean men in general. So it's not men, or it's not, I'm not talking about. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, gender, you know. So um, one way, as an artist and as a human being, we are a product of our social environment, our culture, our history. So one thing that I do a lot is, you know, talking uh, to different, you know, uh, people. Sometimes, you know, people who have lived, you know, the experience when it's coming to the subject that I want you to depict. Sometimes uh, I uh, talk you know, to people who, who are familiar with the, with the story, so sometimes I I get you know some uh, verbal um, verbal you know, stories you know from different you know, people. So where they sometimes you know it's just stories you know that pass on you know from one generation to the next, and then people familiar with the uh, with the with the oral story of the subject on the subject. So sometimes you know that's helped me a great deal, and sometimes you know I go physically to the area where a certain event had taken place and that helped me to find um, to find information, to find some certain elements in the environment, you know, in order you know, to paint the paintings, you know, other than just reading, you know, information that is written, you know, on the on the subject. So for example, if I to paint, you know, Queen Anakaona, for an example, I yes, I have um, I have, um, yes. Maybe explain who Queen Anakaona is. Yes. Okay. Uh, queen Anakaona is an indigenous you know, queen. Uh, she was uh, an indigenous queen of Haiti uh, during the time when um, the, the European, following you know, the Christopher Columbus, uh, landing in Haiti. In 1492, so she was relatively young at that time, but she was uh, uh, she had governed you know the southern part of the peninsula and Haiti with her brother, so she was known for her um, for her artistic ability. She was known uh, as a very uh, powerful uh, figure. So she was very influential when it's coming to the culture. And she was an actress, she was a, a poet, and um, she was a great you know, leader that represents you know, her people. But of course, and um, later she was tricked uh, by one of the Spaniard uh, governor who wanted you know, to take over you know, her kingdoms and tricked her in a way, you know, she was murdered, you know, so. But, you know, to do, uh, to paint her, I had you know, to go to Leogan. But at the time, uh, during her lifetime, Leogan you know, was called uh, Yaguana. That's where her kingdom is located in the southern part of Haiti. So, and I had you know, to speak, you know, to different people in that area who know, you know, they, all you know history about her, and I, I had you know, to read many books, 
you know, to understand and to feel closer to the character. So usually when I'm painting a painting, I usually try to find a lot of information about you know, the, the, the subject and to feel that I am part of the subject, but I'm not the artist. Just depicting the subject, but I, am, I, f I just want to feel some kind of unity with the subject and feel that I'm living, I'm uh, living in that time period to feel comfortable, you know, before I start, you know, painting, a, a, a painting a physically. So, which brings me back to this idea that there is this um, spiritual dimension in your work. I mean, we see that, uh, especially in paintings such as Ceremony du Bois Caïma, that's uh, on the wall over there that we, I want us to look at. So, um, I just want to hear you talk a bit about this artist your practice as a spiritual, the spiritual elements of your work. And I remember the first time I met you at Tulane way back when, <laughs> in probably like 2000, we talked and um, one of your paintings I had seen was the Battle of Etier. And when I was asking you about your process, you said, and I still remember these words about 20 years later, that you felt as if you were possessed. So can you talk to this possession, feeling as if um, you were taken over perhaps by the ancestors that it is no longer you painting, but somebody else. And you talked the same way when you were talking about um, uh, Marie Lavo, which we'll get to later. Can you talk to that connection, that spiritual practice or spirituality? Yes, um, when it's coming to say when you work and many of my other paintings. So for me, painting uh, these historical paintings, for me, it is, it is a journey. It is a spiritual journey from the uh, starting point to the finishing point of the, of, the, of the work. So sometime when I am painting, and at some point, especially when it's come to this historical painting, at some point I feel as if uh, I am a witness of the event being depicted. I am not the artist. And sometimes uh, I've, ex I've experienced that uh, as I was painting and I feel, I see, you the, I see a hand holding you the brush painting, but I felt as if you the as if you that hand was not connected you know, to my body. And there were your know, time as I was painting, and I was painting on a uh, on a six feet uh, long painting. It was horizontally positioned and I felt there was no sense of gravity when it's come to my body in relation to the ground. I felt that I was floating in front of the painting without walking from one end to the other. So this type of experience, for me, it's really, um, it just, it's a sense of connection you to the, to the ancestors and who inspired me to paint you this painting. So I would say that, you know, when it's coming to spirituality, it's something that is embodied, you know, in the in the work, and also it is part of my experience, you know, in that journey when it's coming to a starting a painting and then to finish the painting. It's always a great experience, and sometimes I got messages, you know, uh, from dreams, through dreams, and where. I, I got messages when it comes to some of the details, you know, that I depict in the paintings, you know, from dreams, you know, from our, my ancestors. Thank you. So one of the uh, things that has come up in your responses and that uh, we discussed as a group yesterday afternoon was this idea of social history being connected to stories, to everyday lived experiences, but often the stories uh, that aren't necessarily told in sort of mainstream historical narratives, the things that maybe everyone learns about in school. Um, and so I was wondering if you could comment on 
the role that you think art in general, but also your paintings in particular, play towards um, expanding our knowledge of, of history and the way we understand it today, um, both as events that happened in the past, but also about um, the way that the past might uh, influence the present and be really important to us today. Please. Again? Okay. I'll try to streamline. There are, there are a couple of questions in there. So this first part is more for the benefit of our audience um, who was not privy to some of our internal conversations yesterday about what we mean when we talk about social histories. Um, and so one of the uh, themes that arose was this emphasis on stories, storytelling, ways of knowing that extend beyond the academy, but also the importance of lived experiences. And I think that some of Ulrich's responses, um, you know, in terms of how you, uh, you talk to people, you go to places, you sort of embody these historical events is a very different way of experiencing and understanding historical people and historical events. So my question, it's a two-parter. <clears throat> One, what do you think the role of art and artistic practices in expanding our understandings of history beyond what we may learn in school? And then how specifically do your, do your paintings um, expand our notions of Haitian history? And you could speak about it with respect to this or another work. Thank you very much. Uh, as you were speaking, um, I was getting inspired for another painting. So, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I think as an artist, um, it's really unpredictable you know, to tell where you are going to get your the next inspiration because you know every experience, every moment is a source of inspiration. So for me, when it's coming here to my painting, and I think since you know uh, the painting embodies a a social, historical, um, aesthetic inequality. So I find it, I find, you know, uh, creating a historical painting, it's something that is educational and, uh, and I feel that even though it is historical, but it is a point of reference to where we are today and what we have you know, to uh, to do, and how we can learn from our uh, from our past experiences. And looking at this painting, and you may feel that well, it is depict a a particular event on Haitian, of Haitian history, but it is part of your history. And socially, this event has an impact upon the United States. And it was the beginning of the Haitian Revolution. So that is fundamental to what uh, this state is today. So without the, without the Haitian Revolution, there would not have been a Louisiana Purchase. And Kansas was part of that, you know, Louisiana Purchase. So, in many ways, I see, you know, my painting is a point of reference educationally, culturally, socially. So, and it brings us all together today. And I know many people, when you hear about, you know, Haiti, it's usually when something goes bad. So you, you read about it on the internet and also, you know, on the front page of the newspaper. But um, when it's coming to Haiti's history, it has a very significant impact upon the world, particularly the U.S., because it shaped the form of the United States geographically. And without this ceremony, voodoo ceremony, Bwakaima in 1791. That was the, the gate 
the opening gate to what happening right at this minute. So it is to say that without the Haitian Revolution, there would not have been Louisiana Purchase. And this ceremony was fundamental. That was the beginning. So I think, you know, socially, and it's really, this is uh, historically, socially, culturally, educationally, I mean, this is a, a painting that is fundamental when it's come to the reference, you know, of what? Kansas, Lawrence, it's all about, and also, that's what brings us all together today. Without the Haitian Revolution, we do not know. Everybody would be speaking French here, because, <laughs> yes. Yes, because, um, so the hate is very significant um, because of the fact that the Haitian Revolution not only allows you know, the United States the opportunity you know, to purchase the U.S., to, to, to purchase Louisiana, but it's helped the United States to protect its own independence because Napoleon's plan was you know, to invade the, uh, Louisiana, to invade the, I mean, to keep Louisiana and eventually you know, to, to not only you know, to build you know, the French Empire in Louisiana, but also you know, to invade the, the American colonies. So with the Haitian Revolution, that did not happen. And it started right here, you know, so. And it is a very significant, you know, painting in the, in the exhibition. So I, I want to go back to this idea of uh, art as a method of producing knowledge. I have had the opportunity to work with you on several projects, and I see you as a social commentator in a history. And it's been a great joy for me to interact with my students to show them a more complex um, Haiti. So what I would like to ask is, how, what I, one of the things, and Casey and I talked about this a lot, is we appreciate is the ways you put women at the center of Haitian history. Can you talk a bit of that? And for that, I want us to go toward Marie-Jeanne La Martinière, one of my favorite um, paintings, to the, on the right side of that wall, showing a woman who is very much empowered and literally in power, who she is in the center, she is leading the battle. So can you talk about the fundamental role that you give women in your, in your work and why is this um, important to you? Thank you. Great question. Um, I think, you know, fundamentally, when it comes to, I mean, when it comes to my personal, personal story, story um, I want you to know that um, I came from a large family, and I have six, I had six sisters, and I was born with one, and I have a twin sister. And so not only um, I remember, you know, at the very beginning of my artistic development, I used to use my sisters and my painting, my drawings as a kid. You know, I used to use them as characters in my drawings. But um, as an adult, as I'm reading uh, about you know, the history of women, and reading about the Haitian history, I felt the need to include more women, you know, in my, as my subject. Because what I realized, I realized that women uh, play a very, significant, a very significant role in the history of humanity. But unfortunately, very often, women have, have been marginalized in the silence of obscurity when it comes to history books. And I feel as an artist, I feel um, compelled um, to
to portrait women in a positive way because I feel that there are many heroes in our history. They are men, but without the support of the women, they would not have been known as heroes. In our Haitian history, there were many women who were on the battlefield. They were the one who provide not only food, water, and, take, and took care of the soldiers who were wounded during the battle, but at the same time, there were many who were fighting alongside you know, the, the men on the battlefield, and they, were, they are not known. They talk about Dessalines, they talk about Toussaint Louverture, Henri Christophe, when it's come to some of the heroes you know, in our Haitian history. But I always feel that there isn't enough being said about the women and the history that contribute you know, as equal uh, to the men. And some women probably have done more than some of the heroes, some of our men heroes. So I feel uh, a sense of responsibility to paint history, but not to be one-sided, but to include everyone. And women, without women, there's nothing. There are a lot of things that we would that would not have existed. You know, for example, music, poetry, there are certain sensitivity, there are certain things that would not have, you know, happened without women. And so women is a source of inspiration to me. Um, and they inspired me in many ways. So that's the reason why they are a part of my focal point when it's come to my artistic creativity. When it's come to Marie-Jeanne, Marie-Jeanne Lamartinière was a nurse, a soldier, a woman who fought the French in the uh, Battle of um, in Creta Pio. Creta Pio was a fortress uh, that was built in, in the northern part of Haiti. And she was um, a very brave woman, and throughout our throughout our Haitian history, she's very known as a brave woman. Even today, people refer to her as a woman who was really brave. And so you could be walking in the street of Port-au-Prince in Haiti, and you you hear somebody said, "Oh, you are a Marijan." And so, which means that, I mean, of course, they, what they want you to say is that, well, you are a very brave woman, you know, so. And so, she really speaks to my creative consciousness. And I feel that this is a woman among many who should be honored, who should not be in the background, uh, where the men are in the forefront, and then she's in the back, background, I feel that. And I feel this way, you know, for many women, whether if they are characters, you know, from um, historical characters, but as well as today, women. And so thank you very much to all of you women for what you have been doing. In fact, I mean, when it's come here to um, invention, inspiration, support, to all of us men who become what we are today without you, we would not have been what we are. And I think it's something you have to take in consideration. Whether if we're talking about our sisters, aunt, mothers, I mean, without you, there would not have been um, those heroes. One thing that I find I have a problem with is the Trinity. And it's going to be one of my paintings, the Trinity. In my painting of Trinity, there will be a woman. There will be the the woman, the 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 father, the the the, the son, but of course, you know, the, the mother. You know, so that's one of the thing that that's one of the painting that I'm inspired to. Paint. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you. Um, just to make it real easy for our cameramen, um, I wanted to 
switch our attention um, to another portrait um, of a really strong, powerful woman from history, um, Marie Laveau. Um, this is serving as KU's 2018-2019 Common Work of Art. Um, for those of you who don't know, the university selects every year a common book that incoming students read. And ever since KU started this program, the Spencer Museum of Art has selected a common work of art to allow students to further engage the themes and ideas in the book through the medium of art. Um, and so we chose this portrait of Marie Laveau, um, and you can perhaps tell us a little bit about her. Um, but one of the things that uh, you sort of hinted at is the influence um, and the connections between Haiti and the United States. Um, and so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, Marie Laveau with respect to that, but also how your experience living in New Orleans um, sort of inspires you to, um, to explore these connections more fully. So you can head over here. Thank you. Living in New Orleans and being a Haitian-born artist, it's, I find it a very inspiring place for me because of what Haiti and the U.S., particularly Louisiana, share. And I find your New Orleans as a nest of inspiration for me. So living in New Orleans enabled me to find information that makes me feel that sense of connection between Haiti and particularly Louisiana, New Orleans. During the Haitian Revolution and following the Haitian Revolution, there were many people who moved from Haiti to New Orleans. And today, what makes New Orleans an interesting place is the fact that people who left Haiti during the revolution had to recreate the society that they used to have in Haiti. So you can see it, it is evident in architecture, the food, and the streets, even the street sign. Um, have you the names of you know some of the people who moved and some of the street sign you know and they are in French, and also in New Orleans, the first art school that was built in 1805 in the French Quarter was people from Haiti, academic art school, and so the revolution had you know sent many people. Of different, you know, from of different of various discipline to New Orleans. So, because of that, I find it interesting you to, for me as an artist, to depict that sense of connection. So, I have done a series on painting that depict um, a, the Louisiana Haiti connections. So, among a many paintings is Marie Laveau. Marie Laveau is one of and the last painting that I have done. And so Marie Lavo, as uh, many of you already know, she's, um, she's known as the queen of voodoo of New Orleans. So she's a historical character who's, who brings, who creates a lot of fascination to people who visit New Orleans, whenever you know, they go to New Orleans, you know, they have you know, to go to her cemetery, to the cemetery where she was buried. So where you know, they create a shrine in front of, uh, in front of the, her tomb. So and people go there you know, to pray in front of her, in front of her tomb. So she lived around the 1840s in New Orleans and her mother was as well, a voodoo priestess, and then she took after her mother, you know. So, in the voodoo tradition, so uh, one spirit, um, if your father or your grandmother or your mother was a voodoo priest or had a certain spirit, um, was she a certain spirit, and sometimes it passed on you know, to the next generation. So, for her, it was the same thing. So she was, a, she was known as a voodoo priestess as well as a Catholic as well. So in this painting, 
The reason why I have here two books, the Bible, one is in French, one is in English. So he was known for as being a very powerful and influential figure during her lifetime in the eighteen forties in New Orleans. So she was very powerful and so she had many clientele and she was known for her spiritual power. And so I felt that sense of connection when it's coming here to voodoo, to the voodoo culture in Haiti. So and I was inspired and to paint this painting I not only I have you know read you know different books on her life. One of the book you know that I read uh, is Marila Vo, the Queen of Voodoo. I cannot remember you know, the the name of the of the author at this time, but there is another book uh, is written by Robert Talent. So that describe you know, her you know activities you know spiritual activities social activities in New Orleans. But she's a very sensationalistic. You know, figures, you know, for tourists who visit, you know, New Orleans you know, today. So this is, um, but they say that, you know, she was very re rebellious. She did not, you know, even though you know, there were laws where uh, there was a law where uh, women of colors had, you know, to hide, you know, their hair, they had, you know, to wear etignon, um, etignon, um, a scarf. Hmm? Had headscarf, um, but to show that you know she 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 was very feisty, so that's the reason why her hair is kind of exposed. So, but she was a very powerful figure and been a very inspiring figure in New Orleans. You know, today if you go you know, to New Orleans and then you say that you want to go to you want to go on a tour. So that would uh, Marila Vos tomb would be included in that too, you know. So uh, there there would not be any tour without you know taking you to Marila Vos, you know, uh, a cemetery, you know, to see the shrine where you know people left you know notes, you know, prayers, you know. And but during her lifetime, you know, they consider her as a saint. She was a voodoo priestess, but a Catholic as well. So and she was a good healer, you know. So and. I, I want to go to this. So you talk about her being a mambo or voodoo priestess and a Catholic as well. And I love the way you put it, you know, the syncretism. And that's one of the most fascinating aspects of the voodoo religion. And um, scholars of Haitian studies usually spell voodoo, V-O-D-O-U, as a way of paying respect to the religion as opposed to V-O-O-Z-O-O, -O -O, which is the sensationalized aspect of anything people don't understand. Oh, it's voodoo, that they don't know what that means. I was um, particularly intrigued of the various ways you show the syncretism between um, Catholicism and voodoo, which is an African-based religion. For instance, we have Marie Lavo holding the asson or good, on the right hand, and on the left hand, she's holding the Bible. So even that choice for me, I imagine, is a conscious choice. And furthermore, we have on top the seven candles, the crucifix, and of course the drums, and the rooster. So I would like for you to talk about some of these elements, especially also the rooster as a symbol of masculinity. So can you tell us, I have my own interpretation, but since, the artist, since you're the artist, it's only fair to ask you. <laughs> well, um, one thing that I want you, wanted you to show, uh, to start with the center poles, with the seven candles. The center poles, you know, in Vodou religion, it's considered, it's, usually it is a pose, you know, that is in the center of the peristyle, and where, you know, they usually, uh, people gather, you know, for a ceremony or a dance, um, so the seven candles represent your seven spirits, you know, seven spirits, but of course, and, uh, some cultures, you know, we consider, you know, seven, number seven as the number of perfection. Um, but, you know, the seven candles represent, you know, the seven spirits, you know, that seven law that, you know, she, uh, she used to worship. 
And of course, you know, the flame of the candles, as you know, universally, uh, fire represents one of the most essential elements of life. You know, and um, fire, water, um, of course, uh, very essential, you know, to life, you know, so it's great, the balance, you know. Um, so the gourd is the, is the uh, we call it, you know, asson, is the instrument that uh, the voodoo priest or priestesses um, use to call upon the spirits. Um, so, as you can see, as she's calling, as she's uh, shaking you the, the gourd, so I give you the impression of a, of a dove uh, coming toward her. So, uh, these are, you know, all the, so I just want you to make sure that um, I show you, I give you a sense of, you know, the spiritual, you know, manifestation by showing you the spirit, you know, in the form of a dove. So, which also represents liberty, as you know, as, yeah, I mean, universally. So, the Bibles, and I just want you to make sure that um, I show both um, the French connection and to language and the English as the American connection because what happened, remember Louisiana was purchased in 1803. So um, at that point, there was a consciousness of Americanization. So in the government, the American government did not want people here to speak French or Creole in Louisiana at that point, but it was part of the American process, Americanization process. So, uh, the drum, and of course, as you know, it, uh, it is one of the oldest instrument, African instruments, and where that drum, uh, during the Haitian Revolution, um, when slaves, or the Maroons who took refuge in the mountains and against, protested against slavery. So they used you know, to use the drums as a way to communicate. So they were not beating the drum only to dance, but it was a way of communication. So it is a sound that travels a lot, far away, miles across the mountains. So if somebody is, is, is drumming, beating the drums, and then you might not, you, it's hard to see how far you know, the sound goes because of all the interferences when it comes to noises. But in a place that is very relatively quiet, and the, you can hear the sounds miles away. But what's, what was you know, so confusing you know, to the colonists at that time is because of the fact that they can hear the drum, but they could not tell if it was coming from the south or if it was coming from the north, east, or west. So, but the people who were familiar with the culture, they knew the sound of the drum and they could tell what the message. They used the drum as a way, you know, to send messages, or sometimes, you know, when they had a plan. So, if they were willing you know, to go. To move forward with the plan, they would beat the drums. And or if they canceled the, that plan, they beat the drums in a certain way. So those who know the code, so they, they would know, you know what to do next. And so also the children. And what I wanted, what I wanted you to show, I want you to show you the continuity or con continuity of life from one generation to the next. And I wanted you to show socially, culturally, educationally, and traditionally how the voodoo religion, the voodoo culture survive, you know, um, through generation, one generation after generation, just like Marie Lavo from her grandmother from her to her mother. So, and pass it on you know, to children, you know. So, 
and the Worcester and the and the uh, voodoo uh, culture, and is one of the announcers of events and times. Um, so when you go you know, to places, especially in the Caribbean or wherever you know, there are Worcesters, you would hear you know, that they they announce. I mean, they they, they call. But usually it's something that they do um, chronologically and, it, and at a specific time. If you're timing your watch, you're looking at and you would see how long it takes and then they always exact. And they always, if it is, if they do it every minute or every 30 seconds, so it would not be 29 seconds or 28 seconds, it would be 30 seconds you know, they, 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 they call, you know. So um, I wanted you to show the whisper because what happened, I wanted you to show um, the, uh, the connection between men and nature. So whether if it is um, in a voodoo ceremony, but, um, but there's, no diff there's, no, uh, there's no separation. Just like you know the theory of relativity, so everything is relatively connected when it's come to life. So, but of course, you know, in ceremonies, sometimes you use the Worcester as a way you know, to make and and uh, to make offering. But in this painting, I did not want you to show the Worcester being sacrificed. I wanted you to show the Worcester. As an, announce, as an announcer, as well as a witness, you know, in this painting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk for another maybe 10 minutes or so with Ulrike, and then we're going to open it up to questions. Um, but we're going to move now into this gallery, so I'll wait for everyone to come in before I, I ask. Test, test. Okay, so earlier when we were speaking, um, you made reference to Haiti's um, sort of importance in shaping the geopolitical, modern geopolitical boundaries of the United States. Um, and Cecile had shared with me that she uh, was in the exhibition with uh, students in her first year seminar. And one of them from architecture and engineering commented that this map that you've painted is, is much more than a, than a map um, in terms of the way that it communicates information and, and historical uh, fact. So it also, for Cecile and I, sort of raised questions about um, notions of power and the generation of new knowledge and how knowledge is created. So I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on um, how you see your work and, and things like maps um, as being integral to the, the generation, the creation of new knowledge, and especially for educating students. Thank you. Um, as you can see, you know, this map was, um, I mean, of course, it is a depiction of the, of the Americas, and, but the focal point is the United States. Um, what I wanted you to show here, I wanted you to show Haiti, and I did not, I, I, I just want, yeah, yeah, proportionally and geographically, that it is clear to you the size of Haiti in comparison to the US. And so that is the reason why I put it. I put Haiti here and showing you the influence where uh, when people migrated you know, to Cuba, 
at the time. So let's, let's go back. All these land, as you can see, they are Spanish lands. Took, yeah, uh, Spain had, you know, took possession of this, all these lands. So keep in mind that Haiti was uh, the first European colony was built um, on the island of uh, Hispaniola, but is the Hispaniola name is, that was the name uh, Columbus had given to the island, but it was Kiskeya, the island of Kiskeya, and also they used to call it Haiti. Uh, the whole island used to call Haiti. So until it was divided and uh, in 1697, uh, between the French and, and, Sp and, and the Spaniard. So the western side is Haiti, the eastern side is remained as the, um, I mean, of course, as Saint-Domingue. And also, the eastern side was Santo Domingo. It's the same name, but it's just like Spanish and French. So, but the island was divided in 1697. So Cuba was still um, the Spanish, you know, we made Spanish possession. During the Haitian Revolution, many people migrated you know, to Cuba. And while Cuba was fighting, while Spain was fighting with France, so people who migrated due to the revolution to Cuba, so they had you know, to leave. They, they came here to the US. So in 1803, so uh, during the Louisiana Purchase, many people used your different route. You know, they go to the East Coast. Yeah, they went to the East Coast, and later, in, in 1803, they started, you know, coming, you know, by different route. So when they learned that, you know, the United States had purchased, you know, Louisiana, so they realized that it was safe, so there would not be a repetition of revolution, so they move many move you to uh, to Louisiana. During that time, um, the population of Louisiana was not that there were not that many people. But in 1809, from 1809 to 1810, only there were about 10,000 people who moved. But in total, they estimated that there were you know, 30,000 people. But in, within one year, 1809, there were 10,000 people. But prior to that, uh, and later, so there were many people. So they doubled you know, the, the, the 10,000 people who are uh, within one year, kind of doubled you know, the Louisiana population. So it is to say that most of the population of Louisiana, they are migrated you know, from Haiti, from Saint-Domingue. So what I wanted you to show you here, I wanted you to show the, the size of Louisiana in comparison to the United States. All these land, they were in dispute, such as Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, they were in dispute. So what happened, you know, the British claimed those lands, and they, well, the US wanted you to aim claim them as well, you know, Mississippi, uh, all these land were in dispute. So th this was, you know, the size of the United States, you know. Um, so in Oregon is the same thing, you know. Oregon, uh, Seattle, you know, all these land, they were in dispute. So in the Spanish on all this. When I, as I was, you know, uh, creating you know, this map, what I was thinking, I was thinking, hmm, this is really interesting. So Columbus landed in 1492, and with the landed, with the landing of Columbus, okay, the Spaniards on all this, and the French on this, the United States and the the British, and I was thinking, hmm. I was thinking critically, so what about the Native American who had been here for hundreds or thousands of years prior to that? Where is, 
where is the land that is reserved for them as the first <laughs> settler of this land? I said, this is interesting. So that's, that's one of the most fascinating thing that experience for me when I was creating the map, it was that rhetorical question, you know, that stays on my mind. And so, but I wanted you to show what, you know, um, America was like, but without the Haitian Revolution, there would not have been the Louisiana Purchase. And so I wanted to show you the size of Haiti and how sometimes, you know, a tiny place or one person in this world can make a big difference. Because just think about it. This size, this is the size of Haiti in comparison to the, what you call the US today. But without Haiti, there would not have been all this land that we ship the United States, because this is what the United States was. Okay. So Haiti has played a very significant role socially, culturally, educationally, when it's coming to what the United States is today. But unfortunately, Haiti doesn't get you credit for that. Because when it's coming to European history and the Americas, it's all begin on the island of Hispaniola. So the first group of European settlers who came, they settled on this island. The first university that was built, it was built on this island. The first European cathedral that was built was built on this island and still exists. And the other side of uh, Hispaniola and the Dominican, now called it the Dominican Republic. So, um, so it is to say that Haiti is more than what people know because what happened, you know, it's history and the way it's shaped you know, the United States, it's something that has been marginalized in history book. So you can read a whole history book about the United States and they do not talk about Haiti's impact and what Haiti means, but Haiti's it's, it's really where, uh, it's where you know, the European culture and history began and transferred, you know, in the America, you know. So, and it is a, it's, it is a history that is part of your, I mean, it is, it is, it, it is a great, you know, point of reference, you know, to us all, but unfortunately they do not talk about it. And it's all politic, you know, it's political. And during the time of the Louisiana Purchase, they did not want you to talk about the revolution because they wanted you, the US government wanted you to contain the revolution, the news about the revolution that was a way you know, to make sure that uh, there would not be another revolution starting in the world because Haiti had influenced you know, the abolition of slavery. And this is the reason why politically Haiti is still struggling to keep its dignity because it declared its independence so early where <coughs> when many other countries in the Americas were practicing slavery and Haiti forced you know, those countries you know, to abolish you know, slavery. And this is the reason why today Haiti is known. People just think, well, eh, whenever you know, they refer you to Haiti, they say, well, the poorest country that is the synonymous you know, name for Haiti. But Haiti was, did not start as the poorest country in the world. Every country that's known as third world, they were not started as third world. It's because of constant exploitation that makes them what they are today. And countries that is that considered as the first, they were not the first. <laughs> so, so it is to say it's constant exploitation that makes Haiti what it is today, but it is a country that is full of historical importance and cultural significance, and that is the reason why I'm inspired to paint what I'm painting today. And so that is why that is why you know it is relevant, you know, for me to paint this painting to remind people what Haiti contributed and world history.
Yes, and so we'll have to take another history lesson with Mr. Jean-Pierre. But um, this is a nice transition to the last painting that I want to bring our attention to briefly, which is um, one of my favorite paintings by um, Ulrich Jean-Pierre, and it's called Crucified Liberty. And it segue nicely with so many of the things uh, Ulrich has been talking about, how um, the uh, and it symbolizes how Haiti has been um, crucified. And I will just mention that um, Haiti, uh, the woman that's symbolic of Haiti is wearing the um, Haitian flag. So I just would like you look, and I'm going to time you for so we can have time for questions, to just one minute, just one minute. I know it's a hard task, but to talk to us briefly about this painting. Okay, <laughs> let's see how it's worked. Um, this is a crucified liberty. So what I wanted you to do, I wanted you to just take, you know, everything had, Haiti had accomplished and put it in one painting and showing how liberty, as a, as a country that is very symbolic, you know, a, when it's coming to liberty, when it's coming to a universal freedom, and how it become reduced as crucified liberty, even though it's restored humanity's dignity and abolition of slavery, you know. And so the cross uh, represents you the remnant of colonization and how Columbus, Christopher Columbus, when he, he arrived in this land, when he got lost, it was the Atlantic Ocean and landed in, uh, in the Americas accidentally. And how he presented the course as if he was a missionary, a savior of humanity, and then brought your civilization? Of course not. And so, how this course still, the remnant, the psychological remnant of this course still playing an impact on the crucifixion of Haiti. So, and I'm showing you the, the, the touch and also the scroll. So that is the, our um, constitution that has not been used, the, the constitutional laws due to politics. And showing the touch, you know, represent, you know, hope. And also, you know, the woman, I did not want you to make her look too African, too European and two indigenous, but since Haiti is a melting pot, and the population of Haiti, the first population was you know, the Tainos, the, the Arawak, the, the, uh, the Caribs. Um, so I wanted you to give a mixture of you know, um, physical appearance. You know. So Haiti has a melting pot, and showing your know, different, you know, uh, 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 all these children, and also, you know, showing socially how politically the division, you know, and between the people, and also you're know, showing people putting money in the treasure, the national treasure, but hand of co of corruption is taking the money in you and U.S. currency because since you can spend, you know, you you can exchange your know, U.S. currency, you know, in different countries. So of course, and this illegal hand is taking the money. And so these are you know, children who have so much you know, to offer, but since Haiti's hand is being tight politically on the geopolitical course, so they couldn't, she could not uh, take advantages of what being given to her. So here I'm showing you the, the Asson and the voodoo religion, and also you know, the bird, the, the, the bird that symbolizes liberty but being monopolized by the force of politics. So the, the bird cannot fly. The eyes represent you, the eyes of the people, the consciousness of the people, and also you know, the Bible used as the way you know, to, it was used during the time of slavery, during the time when they came and trying you know, to uh, convert you know, the Native American and to make them become so docile so that they could enslave them and took over the land. So this half circle represents a boat. 
as well as the globe of the earth, in a way, and to show that we are all in the same boat. Whether if you're talking about a boat in the context of Haiti, the Haitian society, but globally, this circle represents the earth. No matter if you think you are European or African, Canadian, Asian, wherever you come from or wherever you are, we are on this earth. If something happened to this earth, it will affect all of us. So we may speak to different languages and we think we do not have anything in common. And we look at you know, our skin, color, we say, ah, yeah, 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 we are not different. But we are not any different because what happened, we, we all have you the same mission in life, and we all have you the same fundamental needs when it comes to survival as a human being. So what I'm showing, I'm showing this as a metaphor uh, of the earth, that we are all in the same boat. You cannot do anything to affect one group of people without being affected by it, because what happened, we are all connected. So I guess, that's a minute and a half. That was a Haitian minute, a Caribbean minute. Um, thank you. Please help me give uh, Mr. Jean-Pierre a round of applause. Um, so we, we do have time for some questions. But before we move on to questions, I wanted to acknowledge Tyler Allen, who was the IRE um, undergraduate fellow who work with Casey and I, travel to New Orleans, so she's a big part of this exhibition, so I wanted to acknowledge her. Oh, happy birthday. I, I, I can't sing, so. <laughs> so um, we're happy to take questions from the audience. I am gonna bring the microphone because we're recording, so um, please, questions, comments. Tyler, come on up, Tyler. Um, so again, Ulrich, Cecil, Casey, and Joey, I'm going to put you in this too. Um, it was awesome working with all of you. Um, and again, I learned a lot as well about Haiti and just the world as a whole from this experience. Um, but what I want to ask you is, how do you feel art can contribute to education? Thank you very much. Art is so fundamental in education that, um, just like I was saying to uh, the artists uh, colleagues here, and I was saying that art is something that we use every day and without being conscious of it. Yes, art. It's very fundamental in everything, everyday life. So whether if you're talking about you know, a child and pre-K and at the very beginning, or, so you have here to use illustration made by artists. Sometimes you know, to show them colors, to show them objects and books. So sometimes showing them object visually is something you know, that's the best way of learning, you know, to begin with. So basically, you know, art is really in everything. So without art, it would really inhibit us, you know, from learning. And it's at, it is at all level. It is not at pre-K only, but it is at everything that we are doing. Every day, we use art. And you go to school, as I gave you an example yesterday as I was talking, and I said, well, if you are going to medical school, you are learning the hum uh, anatomy of the human body. So usually, it's not from photography. It's usually from an artist who draw you know, the, all the bones or most of the organ that you know a camera cannot see, cannot uh, distinguish from one organ to the other, or or, or the shape. So it's always an art by an artist. So art is very fu fundamental in education. So art is education itself. You know. So yes. 
I mean, I think I will say for me as a Lithuanian cultural uh, scholar, one of the exciting things for me being at KU is to give my students a visual representation of Haiti. This exhibit in particular has allowed me to have complex conversations and push students um, to challenge what they thought they knew about American history. I mean, for instance, as you walk in the gallery to your left, Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, the founder of Chicago, students were shocked that, oh my God, he was from what is today Haiti, Saint-Domingue, Jean-Jacques Audubon, the, um, the great ornithologist. You know, being from Haiti, that connections. So as we know, many students do not read as much as we would like them to read, or not at all sometimes. So to visually um, interact with this work, it has provided a space to have complex conversation. For instance, this um, painting that's not one by um, Mr. Jean-Pierre, but you know, um, three angels with black Jesus. I mean, just the title. Students see that, it's like, whoa. And my students, part of their assignment, and this is a first year seminar course students, this is their first, one of the first classes they're taking. They just had to choose a painting. And what does that do to them? To decolonize knowledge, to question knowledge. What are some of the knowledge? And I think I would build off of Cecile's response by saying it's not just the content of works of art, but often the way they can be used as pedagogical tools in ways that sometimes other things can't. Um, I've been doing a lot of class teaching, classroom teaching in this exhibition, um, especially uh, I've talked a lot about the portrait of Marie Laveau. And we've t used it to talk a lot about issues of race and conversations that might be difficult to enter into or uncomfortable. Um, I've worked a lot with first year students too, so kind of engaging with these issues in a public sphere is scary for a lot of them. But suddenly you put something that they can reference, that they can talk to, that they can look at critically, gives them an entree into talking about um, you know, things that are not only that they may not have known, but that might be difficult and uncomfortable. And so I think our role as an art museum is also to open up those kinds of conversations um, and dialogues even when they become uncomfortable. And I think art plays maybe one of the most important roles um, ever in, in that uh, project. Nancy, did you have a question? A lot of the um, paintings in this room, uh, of your paintings, they're juxtaposed with paintings from Haiti from the mid 20th century. Did any of these artists influence your art? Thank you. Yes, you know, some of the artists in, the, in this exhibit have, you know, influenced my artistic you know, development, because I remember, you know, as a kid in Haiti, I used, you know, to see some of the photograph, uh, photograph of their paintings and books. And one of the books that I can remember, <laughs> I can think of is a book that you give me as a gift. And I told you that that, get, that book, you know, brings me great memory, because I lost my doing Katrina in New Orleans, because I lived in New Orleans during Katrina, my studio and home was flooded. So I lost, you know, a countless, you know, uh, books, magazines, newspapers, and including the, those books on Haitian art. And that included a photograph of some of these, you know, artists. So um, I guess, you know, your question, you, uh, I do not want you to monopolize you know, the, the time. So do you have another question that, I mean, that's related you know, to the differences between my art, my painting and their paintings? Okay. <laughs> yes, because, yes. In, in, if I may add, um, Casey and I, and I'm not a curator, so I came with like no knowledge. This has been a learning experience for me. One of the things we did as part of uh, 
getting to this point of the exhibit. We, um, Ulri came about a year um, ago in August and we went to our collection. So we had to decide how are we going to pair his work with works of other artists that are very different um, in terms of, you know, styles, genre, etc. So as we came with the teams and with um, Casey, um, Tyler, and other colleagues, we went through thematically. So Ulrich also had a say in which paintings we chose, even though we had four main teams. So I don't know if that helps a bit with your question. And I know, for instance, Bernard Sejourné, some of the artists he was influenced with, which one of the painting in the section on women, um, that beautiful painting of uh, Asifid skull. I know, for instance, uh, because I've worked with Ulrich, like with De Bruyere, for instance, even their representation, challenging classic representation of religion. We see that with this painting with um, angels, with um, Three angels with blood, Jesus. So I was wondering, because you have more than one painting that depicts an indigenous person from Haiti, why was it important for you to include indigenous people in your work? Okay, so Caitlin asked, um, or Caitlin mentioned that um, of the 12 works of yours that we have in this exhibition, more than once you depict an indigenous person from Haiti. So could you comment on why it was important for you to portray indigenous people in your work? Yes, it is important to me because what happened, we are talking about the history of humanity. It's not only the history of Haiti. When I paint, and so I feel that everyone should be included. And we all have, you know, um, commonality, whether if we did not live here that time period, you know, when the American natives uh, were here, you know, in the past. But of course, anyway, we are all here because generation after generation. So you can see that the culture is still alive. So for me as an artist, I do not exclude, I include. And I think what we need in this world is unity and is to recognize the importance of what everybody brings. And also the history of the indigenous you know, people of the America is very much of interest you know, to me because they were here first and so any way that I, whatever I, that I can do as an artist you know, to preserve uh, their memory, so I feel that it is something that is crucial you know, to do. So, and that is the reason why. And it is not the only painting that I painted of the indigenous people. I have many more, but since you know, we were limited, we could not bring more paintings. So otherwise, you know, there, would, there would have been more. And, so, as I say, I, I do not exclude. I have, you know, painting of Christopher Columbus landed, you know, in Haiti, meeting, you know, the indigenous young people. So, it's not part of the exhibit because we're limited. But it is great for me you know, to feel uh, as an artist that, you know, I'm not limiting myself, you know, to just what I would call my personal history, but my personal history is your history, your personal history, your history is my history. It's the history of humanity, and there's only one race when it comes to humanity. And that's what I, I try you know, to give, you know, to put in the focal point when I paint. So I do not paint just for the pleasure of painting. I paint because it is an obligation. It is something that is important to me, to my well-being. And I'm not a politician, I'm an artist. So everybody is included in my, in my subject. Thank you. I think we have time for one more. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry, it's uh, not that well prepared. But I just I wanted to kind of prompt maybe 
asking about your process a little bit um, in uh, like shape and like uh, color selection and how that could equal like uh, telling a narrative. Um, I, uh, I see a lot of swooping figures that lead into the next one that, uh, that uh, is to great effect. Um, and especially like the, the very light pastel colors that are put in juxtaposition to that. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the process of how those are developed a little bit. Yes, the creating a painting, as I always say, that it is a journey. And you have one ID, and by the time you finish, it's something totally different. And you only capture fragment of your original thoughts, and especially when it comes to dealing with colors. So you may start with a color, and by the time you finish the painting, the color kind of changes, because every day you work on the painting, you are in a different mood, and your mood affects you, the colors. So for example, if I'm painting a painting, if I'm working on a painting, I am feeling I have bad news. So that can affect you, the colors, you know, at the time. But when it's coming you to this painting, it was very symbolic to me to focus on a particular scheme of colors. So um, as I'm painting, in a way, I'm a, I follow my emotion. Other than, I mean, of course, you know, I was, I respect you the content, but there is certain thing as an artist you can do is to recognize that you have the freedom and while you are creating a work of art, it's just like you are a pilot who is flying an airplane. So you know the basic rules, but the sky is limitless in terms of space, as long as you are not interfering in the space of other you know, airplanes. So is to be bold enough and then follow your emotion, your intuition, and make a judgment based on balance. And so it is something that is very personal and very spiritual. So I do not always feel that I have full control because as an artist, no matter how much you know, the accident time when you are creating, your work is really dictating you what to do. Because what happens, sometimes you take a look at what you do, and then your intuition, your emotion, improvisation dictates the, 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 the continuing process. So when you finish that work, and then you say, wow, that's not what I intended to do. But I like you know, the finishing part. So, but I should say that, you know, uh, as I'm painting, sometimes I'm guided, you know, by spiritual forces uh, without knowing it. And later, and I felt that, well, but I painted this, I don't remember when I picked you that particular color. So what happened? But it came out so perfectly. You know, so, but I think, you know, it's quite an experience. It's quite a journey and a spiritual, you know, experience. But sometimes the spirit, you know, guides me during the process with respect, you know, for the, for the content, you know. Um, but in that painting, it was a very symbolic painting to me. So. And, and the spirits are guiding me to stop as well as Joey. <laughs> um, so I just, we just have um, two brief announcements. Uh, this has been such a wonderfully pleasurable experience for me. So I just want to thank a few colleagues at the Spencer Museum. Um, of course, uh, Tyler, who worked with me, Kathleen, who went to countless numbers of email, um, Alexis, who got us money. Um, that's important. Richard, I remember walking through, you know, he has his bucket of tapes. I mean, for me, it has been so great because I come to the, and I appreciate, love the art, but the amount of work that it takes to get from conceptualizing this to making it happen. Um, Amy, of course, Sarah Lynn, the director, 
um, Joey, and uh, it all started with Selka and my colleague Jessica, who's not here. It started with a conversation, and then that led to this. So I'm just very grateful to be working with such amazing colleagues, and it has been a wonderful, joyful experience to work with Casey, and we're still friends after two years. <laughs> It was pretty easy to stay friends, and it was great to make new friends. Um, so for those of you who are going to be joining us um, for other social history programs, I just wanted to remind you once again that uh, uh, Blackfoot artist uh, Adrian Stimson will be doing a performance as Buffalo Boy at 1.30 p.m. at the Haskell Auditorium on Haskell Indian Nations University campus, and that event is open to the public. Um, if anyone needs directions or clarif uh, clarifications on where it's taking place, please just come talk to me or Joey. Um, we, can, we can provide you that information. And then tomorrow morning at 10.30 in our auditorium, Tina Takamoto will be giving an experimental lecture, which I'm really excited about. So thank you all for being here today, and we hope to see you uh, as our program continues.